You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take that is also a Heroes of the Faith story on the name day of Father Placid White, Order of St. Benedict. When our family got wise to the conciliar hijacking of the church and found the true faith, largely through Father Francis Fenton, My mom and dad were directed by that good priest 1,700 miles away to Father White's parish in Colorado. There were still six of us in school, and Our Lady of Victory Church was one of very few at that time that offered a K-12. through It was probably the hardest and best thing my parents ever did, uprooting and moving west, and one of the lasting graces of that decision was that we were blessed to know one of the great priests of the modern era. When we knew Father White, he was in his 80s and becoming frail, but a dearer and more holy priest you will never find. Like his name saint, whose biography follows, he defines the word placid or peaceful, surely because his faith in God was so complete, and after his long and eventful life, he'd seen pretty much everything and lived through more than most. He was unflappable. I have to share a short story that tells you a little bit about this side of Father White as I knew him. For two years in the early 1980s, I taught primary grades in Our Lady of Victory School, Father White's parish, and because I passed right by the rectory, which was eight or ten blocks from church, I would stop every weekday morning in the family station wagon, my younger siblings in the back seat, and pick up Father for Mass because he no longer drove. Now, 1982 was an epically snowy year. A blizzard hit the Denver metro area on Christmas Eve, and the snow didn't completely melt until well after Easter. But if you know about Colorado weather, it didn't stay icebox cold enough to keep the roads cleared and dry, but would melt just enough sometimes during the day to wet low-lying roadways that then froze overnight. You never knew when you were going to run into a patch of black ice. Now, Before I go much further, I should describe Father White. He had a thick British, actually South African accent, and he was not much into casual conversation, except when he had a new joke to tell. And you had to listen carefully to discern the punchline. It was always worth it, just for his silent laugh and the way his shoulders shook. He was a slight man, mostly bald when we knew him, and he had pretty poor eyesight. In fact, we all wondered how he saw at all because his eyes always looked closed, as you can see in the photograph. Honest to goodness, and no disrespect intended at all because we loved him dearly, but we all thought Father looked like Mr. Magoo, a cartoon character of the time. It was a matter of speculation what color his eyes were because no one had ever seen them. Until one day. I had stopped to pick Father up early, but not bright. The sun had barely risen and the air was biting cold. I always walked up to the door to accompany him down to the car, and he always called me sweetheart, I'm pretty sure because he could never remember my name, and he bundled into the front seat, my siblings half asleep in the back seat. With just a little slipping and sliding that day, I pulled off the side street where the rectory was and onto the two-way road toward church up the gentle hills and down, one block, two blocks, and down into a trough that, after driving for 40 years now, would prick up my mental yellow light. But I hadn't been driving very long at that time and didn't take the precautions then that I would now. But we hit a big patch of black ice. The car slid counterclockwise in a circle into the oncoming lane in what seemed like slow motion. My heart was like to beat right out of my chest, my whirling mind trying fruitlessly to grab onto any solution for this scenario. The children in the back seat screaming and, and wait, wait, what were they saying? A truck! There's a big delivery truck barreling down the hill heading right for us as we continue to slowly turn all the way around, a complete 360, arriving back in our lane just as the truck passes, blaring its horn. This is a true story, you guys. It was terrifying, to us at least, but apparently not to Father White. And this is the best part, why this story lives on in family lore, Father White's reaction. 
When I looked over at him mid-circumnavigation, his eyes were wide open. He was smiling, and no kidding, he was going, Wee! Near death was nothing to Father White. When we got to the church, he got out and thanked me as he always did for the ride, but with a touch of irony in his voice and a funny little smile. The punchline was that God's hand was no less upon us on that icy road than it was every other minute of every other day. God bless Father White. Here is the biography printed in the ORCM newsletter, The Athanasian, on the occasion of his death in 1989. Father Placid F. White, OSB. Because of his travels for a number of years on the traditional Latin Mass circuit, the above name is one familiar to many of the readers of the Athanasian. Father White, a Benedictine, died on September 21st of this year at the venerable age of 90. On September 26th, he was buried with a solemn high requiem mass at Our Lady of Victory Chapel in Aurora, Colorado, where he had formerly served as a pastor for some eight years. Father White was born in England as a non-Catholic and became a convert to the faith at the age of 18. His studies for the priesthood were made primarily at the Benedictine College of St. Anselmo in Rome. On July 7, 1925, he was ordained to the priesthood in Rome at the Church of Saints Cosmas and Damien. In addition to assignments in the earlier years of his priesthood in England, Spain, and the Philippine Islands, he served as a chaplain during World War II with the British Army in Africa. In 1951, Father White came to the United States, becoming a citizen of this country in 1956. After some four years' service as a hospital chaplain, he became pastor of a parish in Springfield, Colorado in 1955. Twenty years later, at the age of 77, he assumed pastoral duties at the traditional chapel of Our Lady of Fatima in Stratton, Colorado. His final pastorate was at Our Lady of Victory Chapel in Aurora, Colorado, where he remained until his retirement in March 1984 at the age of 85. It was in the early 1970s that Father White determined that the church which he was still a member of was no longer the church to which he had converted in his youth and which he had served for so long as a priest. Convinced of this, he broke with the conciliar church, becoming one of the few truly traditional Roman Catholic priests in America, which is to say that he firmly believed that the conciliar church was not Catholic and that John Paul II was not a valid pope. He was, in a word, one of those rare priests, a sede vacantist, and he did not hesitate to identify himself as such whenever he had occasion to do so. Father Placid White was a true man of God, a priestly priest, devout, humble, of deep faith, thoroughly dedicated to the cause of Christ and his church. Although the Benedictine order to which he belonged has since gone the way of the conciliar church, he remained always a loyal spiritual son of the great Saint Benedict. How sorely does our beloved church need today more priests of the caliber of Father White. May the good Lord, whom he served so long and so well on earth, deign to receive him with those glorious words of welcome. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And now the biography of St. Placid and Companions, with whom I feel sure Father White is enjoying eternity. St. Placid, along with 35 companions, is called the proto-martyr of the Benedictine order. One of the right-hand men of St. Benedict, St. Placid was heir to a family fortune, not of material riches, as the descendants of Roman nobility lost their titles and wealth when Rome fell, but of a spiritual heritage stretching back to his ancestor, St. Eustatius, whose feast day we celebrated on September 20th. The oldest of four children, St. Placid exhibited all the signs of a calling in religion as a small boy, and without hesitation, though it was a cloistered abbey and his son not yet a teenager, his father, Tertullus, encouraged his eldest child to answer his vocation in the fledgling order of St. Benedict. As Abbot Garanger says, quote, In those days parents loved their children not for this passing world, but for eternity, not for themselves, but for our Lord, end quote. And the example of St. Eustatius and his family, and no doubt their prayers from heaven, 
motivated heroic courage in Tertullus and all of his children, as all four children ultimately won the martyr's crown. We see this so often in the lives of the saints, don't we? How holiness seems to run in families, not due to any kind of predestination, perish the thought, or some kind of random luck, but because fertile soil grows healthy plants. Prayers beget prayers, habits teach habits, and holiness is, like we said earlier this week, irresistible. Here's the entire story of St. Placid as recorded in the breviary. Placid, a Roman by birth and son of Tertullus, belonged to the noble family of the Anisi. Offered to God while still a child, he was entrusted to St. Benedict and made such progress in sanctity and in the monastic life as to become one of his principal disciples. He was present when the Holy Father Benedict obtained by prayer a fountain of water in the solitude of Subiaco. While still a boy being sent one day to draw water, he fell into the lake, but was miraculously saved by the monk Maris, who at the command of the Holy Father Benedict ran dry shod over the water. Later on, Placid accompanied St. Benedict to Monte Cassino. At the age of 21, he was sent into Sicily to defend against certain covetous persons the goods and lands which his father Tertullus had given to Monte Cassino. On the way, he performed so many great miracles that he arrived at Messina with a reputation for sanctity. He built a monastery on his paternal estate not far from the harbor and gathered together 30 monks, being thus the first to introduce the monastic life onto the island. Nothing could be more placid or more humble than his behavior. He surpassed everyone in prudence, gravity, kindness, and unruffled tranquility of mind. He often spent whole nights in the contemplation of heavenly things, only sitting down for a short time when overpowered by the necessity of sleep. He was most zealous in observing silence, and when it was necessary to speak, the subjects of his conversation were the contempt of the world and the imitation of Christ. His fasts were most severe, and he abstained all the year round from flesh and every kind of milk meat. In Lent, he took only bread and water on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. The rest of the week he passed without any food. He never drank wine and always wore a hair shirt. So numerous and so remarkable were the miracles he worked that the sick came to him in crowds to be cured, not only from the neighborhood, but from Etruria, which is central Italy, and Africa. But Placid, in his great humility, worked all his miracles in the name of St. Benedict, attributing them to his merits. His holy example and the wonders he wrought caused the Christian faith to spread rapidly. In the fifth year after his arrival in Sicily, the Saracens made a sudden incursion and seized upon Placid and his thirty monks while they were singing the night office. At the same time were taken Placid's brother Eutychus and Victorianus and his sister the virgin Flavia, who had come from Rome to visit him, also Donatus, Faustus, and the deacon Fermatus. Donatus was beheaded on the spot. The rest were taken before Manucha, the chief of the pirates, and as they firmly refused to adore his idols, they were beaten with rods and cast bound hand and foot into prison without food. Every day they were beaten afresh, but God supported them. After many days they were again led before the tyrant, and as they stood firm in the faith, they were again repeatedly beaten, then stripped of their clothes and hung head downward over thick smoke to suffocate. They were left for dead, but the next day were found alive and miraculously healed of their wounds. The tyrant then addressed himself to the virgin Flavia apart, but finding he could gain nothing by threats or promises, he ordered her to be stripped and hung by the feet from a high beam, insulting her meanwhile. But the virgin answered, Man and woman have the same author and creator, God. Hence, neither my sex nor this indignity which I endure for the love of him will be any disadvantage to me in his eyes, who for my sake chose not only to be stripped, but also to be nailed to a cross. Manucha, enraged at this reply, ordered her to be beaten and tortured with a smoke and then handed over to be dishonored. At the virgin's prayer, however, God struck all who attempted to approach her with sudden stiffness and pain in all their limbs. The tyrant next attacked Placid, the virgin's brother, who tried to convince him of the vanity of his idols. Manucha therefore commanded his mouth and teeth to be broken with stones, and his tongue to be cut out by the root. 
but after this was done, the martyr spoke as clearly and as easily as before. The barbarian grew more furious at this miracle and commanded that Placid, with his sister and brethren, should be crushed under an enormous weight of anchors and millstones. But even this torture was powerless to hurt them. Finally, Placid, together with 36 of his religious family, his siblings, and several others were beheaded on the shore near Messina and gained the palm of martyrdom on the 9th of October in the year of salvation 539. Gordian, a monk of that monastery who had escaped by flight, found all their bodies entire after several days and buried them with many tears. Not long afterward, the barbarians, in punishment of their crime, were swallowed up by the avenging waves of the sea. St. Placid and companions, pray for us. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints.